The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar, and its seal, the madness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest bound which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were incidents of half an hour. But Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his crenellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers having entered brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of, of despair or of a frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure there were buffoons, there were improvisateurs, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long straight vista while the folding doors slide back neatly to the walls on either side so that the view of the whole action is scarcely impeded. Here the case is very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision was embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at the right and left. In the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes were scarlet a deep blood color. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for color and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with the barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. 
It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen in Hernani. They were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There were much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And the revel went whirlingly on until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And thus it happened. Perhaps that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus too it happened that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur of horror and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had outherited Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seem now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all of this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revelers around. But the murmur had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death his vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of his face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell on the spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed, in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste but in the next his brow reddened with rage who dares he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery seize him and unmask him that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements 
It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with a deliberate and stately step, made a closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the murmur had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth a hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet. Ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him, it was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddened with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry and the dagger dropped gleamingly onto the sable carpet upon which most instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death, Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the enumer whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasps in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and the corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness untentanded by any intangible form, and now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in this bearing posture of his fall and the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired in darkness and decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all.